everyone. Uh, welcome to the Humanities Institute at, at Stony Brook. I am Adrián Pérez Mergoza, the director of the Institute, and we are really delighted to have this opportunity to listen and to converse with Lincoln Cushing, an independent archivist and historian. Welcome, Lincoln, and of course, welcome to all of you to our Institute in this, its virtual format. Before we start today's event, let me just give you two short announcements. First is that the deadline for applications for the 2022-23 round of the, Hispanic, uh, the Humanities Institute at Stony Brook Fellowship is and, uh, now to introduce Lincoln Cushing and his work, we welcome Professor Sol Lee from the Department of Art. Professor Sol Lee has been instrumental in organizing today's talk and is also a part of a cycle of talks that she's organizing with her students on around the exhibit that will be in Sugar Gallery in December under the title Printing Solidarity, Tricontinental Graphics from Cuba. So please join me in welcoming Professor Soldi and in thanking her for her hard work in making all this cycle of lectures and the exhibit possible. So Sol is your platform now. Thank you, Adrian, and also Adrian uh, for organizing um, this talk. Um, I wanted to just highlight a co-sponsor of this um, event, um, LAX, Latin American and Caribbean Studies, um, and uh, their fall uh, a calendar as well. Um, the director of LAX, uh, Lena Burgos Lafonte, and also graduate uh, assistant Camila Rubini um, have been uh, uh, um, instrumental as well uh, for uh, making an uh, announcements about uh, this event across the campus and beyond. And as Adrian mentioned, this talk is part of the exhibitions, um, a prog public program um, exhibition called uh, Printing Solidarity, um, which is co-organized um, uh, by uh, four graduate students in our history department and the Zucker Gallery. Um, as well as um, the Interference Archive, um, archive based in Brooklyn from which um, these posters, uh, most of them are coming from. So um, I'm extremely pleased to introduce Lincoln Cushing, whose text my undergraduate class has been um, uh, uh, reading uh, for the past uh, couple of weeks. Um, Lincoln has worn many hats over the years of his life. Um, uh, at times a printer, at times artist archivist, um, an author and academic librarian. Uh, Lincoln was also born um, in Cuba, if I got it right, to American uh, parents. And his first visit back to Cuba as an adult um, was for the Habana Biennale um, in 1989, uh, the third Habana Biennale. Um, and that's also a research subject of mine, and I'm really excited to um, find the uh, uh, coincidence as well. Um, so what um, I have been teaching for my art history courses include essays from his revolution, Cuban poster art, uh, published in 2003, as well as his essay, um, uh, on the translation of Uspal images uh, by American uh, graphic designers um, that was included in uh, the exhibition catalog Armed by Design, uh, published in 2015 by Interference Archive. So after Lincoln's talk, um, we are going to have our very own um, Eric Zolo from History Department, um, who has also created uh, a, a Cuban poster uh, exhibition a long time ago at Franklin and Marshall College um, and has known Lincoln for many, many years. Um, uh, just to introduce Eric very briefly, um, Eric's first book, We Fried Elvis, The Rise of the Mexican Counterculture from 1999 has been extremely widely read and widely cited. And he recently published a monograph uh, titled The Last Good Neighbor, Mexico in the Global 60s uh, from Duke University Press. So we uh, we are extremely delighted to have you, uh, Lincoln. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen and allow you to share um, your presentation. Thank you very much. I will um, jump into this. I encourage everybody to keep your questions till the end, but I really like some questions. That would be wonderful. Let me do this.
Are we good? Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about is not just the objects of the art, but what they represent and how they fit into the, the revolutionary transformation in Cuba. And Cuba is one of the countries where posters really did play an incredibly powerful and significant role. But first, let's start off with, we want to honor the people that lived on these lands before us. And here are three Cuban posters that I've selected. These are all from Ospal that are honoring sort of the indigenous resistance. And, and you start to see sort of one of the, the visual tricks that, that the Cuban posters are really good about doing is taking history and applying it to the present. You know, the poster on the left, you've got traditional indigenous figures with modern weapons in the background. So it's just an example of the kind of ways that the visual imagery works on many levels. And as you look through these posters, you will see that these are not just flat static items, but they often have embedded stories just within the imagery. Um, this, what, what are posters? I mean, pe people don't think about posters very much unless you're a poster freak like I am. And so here's a, a, an example from the Spanish Civil War, 1936, describing them as soldiers of paper and ink alongside those of flesh and blood. Another term I've heard used for posters is paper bullets. You know, these are, these are effective propaganda tools in the right circumstances. And as we'll see, it's not like this is ancient history. People still have a need for posters now in this world of the World Wide Web. Um, I want to first dedicate this to a few of my colleagues. These are artists that I had the luck to get to meet in Cuba. Um, wonderful people, dedicated artists to the cause, and just wonderful human beings. Um, so you'll see some of their work in, in this show, but um, part of what I want to get across is, you know, history is a moving target, and any of you that are considering uh, maybe interviewing somebody do it earlier rather than later. You don't want to find that, oh, I missed that opportunity to talk to somebody because they're gone now. So even a bad interview is better than no interview at all. So I encourage people to just whip out your phone, spend 20 minutes talking to somebody and recording it. That could be really, really useful research material. So the context within Cuba is we've got a country that after the revolution got rid of commercial advertising. And so you don't have streets full of billboards advertising Nike and beer and real estate. You've got, you've got public art as, as propaganda in the streets. And therefore, they have a lot more of an impact than they would in our country. And so who produces this stuff? There is independent artwork made within Cuba. But what I'm talking about is sort of the, the intersection of state-sponsored art for public good, that we would consider these public service messages. And the three agencies that did these that I'm gonna go through are Editora Politica, which is the publishing arm of the Cuban Communist Party, ICAIC, which is the Cuban Film Institute, which produced films on their own and posters for those films, and also OSPAL, which worked with Tricontinental and produced a whole series of posters, many of which you'll be seeing in your exhibition coming up. And so you think, oh, the publishing department of the Cuban Communist Party, it must be like a really, you know, you know, big fancy building with a lot of high paid folks. No, it's like this funky little building in downtown Havana. It's, you know, this is, in, in Cuba, everything is really on a very common level. There isn't, fanciness is not cool. And so the Cuban Communist Party and Editora Politica, they're just folks. You know, they've just got regular offices. Um, the air conditioning breaks down. Sometimes there's no toilet paper. They're just like everybody else. They don't, they don't play favorites for, oh, if you're a party member, you get special great benefits. My experience within Cuba is that people within the party, it's like it's a it's a service project. So here's the here's the built the door to the Cuban Communist Party offices. And their, their project, they produced all sorts of material, books, billboards, posters, all sorts of media about promoting the goals of the Communist Party. You know, here's one from Rene Medeiros, who's, who you saw the face earlier. You know, I want to study to be a teacher. I mean, a lot of these are what we would consider public service messaging. But the style is distinctly Cuban. 
you know, extremely graphic. You know, other countries have poster art that's like, for example, the Chinese derived from painting, or a lot of other countries derive their artwork from photographs. Most of the Cuban poster art is derived from illustrations that are made for screen print reproduction, like this. Beautiful, bold colors. These are both screen prints. And so here's examples of a motorized health brigade, you know, getting motorcycles out to the countryside to make sure that people are in good shape. Or, um, you know, a, a occupational safety poster, you know, be careful when you're trimming meat. I mean, it's a beautifully elegant design, but it's about a, a tough subject. So, you know, they're tackling difficult subjects in a beautiful artistic way. Um, you know, grow produce for, you know, for yourself. You know, this is their, they're encouraging people to have their own little gardens. Um, this one on the right about joining the, the sugarcane harvest. Well, you know, the sugarcane's been turned into these, you know, green and black things. And the, the text is like a machete cutting through this. I mean, they really play with visual puns. That's one of the qualities and, and the colors. The colors just blow at you. Um, here's about saving electricity, you know, and, and what's the one room that has electricity? It's a room with somebody reading. So it's like they're encouraging, you know, socially beneficial tasks as well. Um, this one on the right about recycling. You know, it's, you know, these are all functions that every government has to deal with, but the Cuban government put a lot of resources into having good art to promote this stuff in a way that, that really encourages you to put this up on your wall. Um, here's a poster that was done for the for the army chess tournament using a hand grenade as a knight. I mean, again, you know, it's a it's a, a incredibly clever design piece. Um, and the one on the right, you know, where you, it's the first graphic design conference. Well, you know, you've got what looks like you know a you know bunch of bullets for a machine gun, but it's it's tools for cultural penetration. This is how we defend ourselves against imperialist culture is with our own tools. But, but you know, military, military self-defense is never far in the background. Now, here's a poster to encourage people to, you know, young people to join the tobacco harvest. Well, the same Cuban Communist Party produces a poster similar looking, but saying, well, you know, tobacco can give you, you know, health disease. So there's, you know, you get these funny contradictions, but Again, when you've got the same agency involved with a wide range of subjects, you get things like this. Um, here you've got the role of African Americans in the Cuban Revolution, which is something which people don't think about. But you know, Cuba was a you know, heavily slave society, and the fight, the Cuban Revolution, a lot of it had precedence of slave rebellions. And so the honoring of that is really important as well. And again, you've got this, this sort of dynamic image where it's, it's like a little you know, series of things. You've got, first you've got the machete, then you've got the breaking of the chains, and then you've got the free hand, and then you've got the holding of the weapon. It's a little storyboard in one static image. So they're very good about that. Or, you know, honoring African-Americans in sports. You know, this is Teofilio Stevens, who, you know, was a, was a boxer. I mean, this is a beautiful image of an African-American honoring their role in society. So that was Editora Politica, the Film Institute. One of the really cool things about the Film Institute was they would show foreign films and they would do their own treatment of that film, as well as doing posters for Cuban films. So you get these beautiful screen print posters that were put up in little kiosks all over town, getting people to come to the theater and see a movie. Here again, you've got a little storyboard. You've got on the left, you've got these slaves in chains, and then you've got the chains breaking, and then you've got the free slave, and then you've got the slave armed. Okay, that's all in one poster. And so it takes you a minute to unpack this, but it's a film poster that really tells you what this is about. They don't talk about the stars of the film, they talk about the subject. But they also use humor. I mean, here you've got, you know, Chilean dictator Pinochet being, you know, whacked with a with a guitar. I mean, it's they they are all they always all about how do you get to people's heads, and humor is really part of that. Um, again, films about U.S. 
films. So here's a poster about Moby Dick, you know, with, you know, filmed by John Huston with, you know, Gregory Peck and Richard Basehart. But it's, but it's about the whale. It's the whale side of the story. Um, this one about Ethiopia, we've got a crown of, you know, the, you know, Haile Selassie's royalty being taken over by the revolution and a flowering of the people coming up from the bottom. They deal with very abstract thoughts. OSPAL, which is my favorite agency and the one that I worked with to basically I developed the first catalog resume. When I went to visit them, I said, how many posters have you done? They said, we don't know. So that got me going. So I instantly started to start to research all the posters that they had done and create a catalog for it because you can't really do the research until you know all the parts. So they were founded in 66 and they closed down a couple of years ago. They no longer exist as an organization. They published Tricontinental Magazine, which I will get to in a minute. Um, it was published in multiple languages. It was a non-governmental organization. It was housed in Cuba, but it wasn't just a Cuban organization. It had a board of people from all over the world. And it had a large peak reading of, and they, they did conferences, they did a lot of things, but it was, it was the largest international anti-imperialist organization in the world. And you look at these, you know, this incredible poster, and you notice that there's little creases in it, these little fine lines. Many of these posters were folded up and put inside the magazine for distribution. Now, most artists think of an art of a poster as being a precious commodity. It's like, oh, you know, you want to mail this to somebody, you roll it up, you put it in a tube, you spend the money to mail it. No, you can't do that if you're putting out propaganda. You fold up the poster, shove it in a magazine, and a week and a half later, it's all over the world. You just unfold it and put it up on the wall. It doesn't matter if it's like creases. It's not a piece of art, it's a piece of propaganda. And so the creases were just fine. So it's almost a badge of honor to see the creases in these pieces. It shows that they were folded up and distributed all over the world, which is, you know, the distribution of a political poster is its Achilles heel. You can have the most incredibly powerful political poster sitting on the floor of a print shop if it doesn't get out, it's doing zero effective. Abstract thoughts. How do you deal with, how do you come up with a poster about colonialism or capitalism? Well, here these are two good examples of coming up with a very abstract idea and showing you know, resistance to colonialism with a, with a pith helmet. And then you've got sort of you know, da Vinci's Vitruvian man chained by capitalism. I mean, these are brilliant design. And again, you see the multiple languages. So what happened to this stuff? These things went all over the world. People saw them. People would pick them up in Cuba. They would get them in the magazines. Friends would come back from Cuba with some posters. And they would be, they would be seen. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth. We, we, we sort of forget that before the age of the internet, there was a lot of travel back and forth to Cuba. I mean, even with the embargo, you could go there, you could sneak in. Um, there were a lot of Americans, a lot of people all over the world that saw Cuban art. And in turn, the Cubans were extremely influenced by the artwork that they saw. All art movements influenced Cuba. You see every art movement reflected in Cuban art. I mean, we're the ones that are isolated, not them. You go to Cuba, you see people from all over the world traveling and visiting there. Our embargo of travel, which is actually the treasury department, you can't spend money there. If you could go to Cuba for free, you wouldn't be breaking a law. It's the spending of a dollar that breaks the law. So it's a goofy, stupid law, but it makes, we feel that Cuba is isolated. The Cubans don't feel that they're isolated because they have people from all over the world. So let's look at that back and forth. So he's Emery Douglas, the most well-known graphic designer for the Black Panther Party. Poster he did in 67. Well, you know, here's a Cuban poster that was done soon afterwards. It was a riff off of his poster. They, they, they expanded it, they added color, um, they changed the weaponry, but it, and this was about Africa, whereas Emory was doing it about African Americans. But from Emory's point of view, this was all fine. Within the movement, sharing was not only okay, it was desired. You were thrilled when somebody else was picking up your artwork somebody else within the movement. You know, here's some examples of an Ospal poster from 67, 
Black Panther Party picked it up in, as a flyer again later on. I mean, it's really, you know, and they turned it into something specifically about free Huey Newton. So every time that there's a translation of it, it gets slightly reinterpreted. You know, here's the same image used in, in a Canadian poster. So a lot of these things get picked up and recycled and I love seeing examples. So if anybody ever runs across an example of somebody who's reinterpreted a Cuban poster, please let me know, because I document all this stuff. Now, here's just examples of a, a poster that was done in Cuba. And again, you know, how many posters can you do about Che Guevara? I mean, these guys roll their eyes and go, it's really hard, but it's, it's such a, you know, a, a worked and worked and worked, you know, visual theme. But but they come up with clever ways of doing it. So here's a sarape with Che's images in it. Well, this image got picked up, you know, and David Kunzley used it in a presentation he was doing. Um, now, again, this is Gestetner art, which for those of you who aren't familiar with printing, it's a very primitive, easy form of, of, of making a digital, a copy on something. This was used in the 70s and 80s. It's difficult to do more than one color. So this poster is a technical masterpiece reflecting an earlier Ospal poster. And by the way, David Kunzel is a major historian about Ospal and Cuban poster art. So he's, he's one of our masters in this, in this subject. Um, but there weren't many books about it. When I did my book in 2003, I was shocked that there hadn't been any other book done on this since 1970. And it wasn't a particularly good book. It was an important book because it was the first book to really showcase Cuban poster art. Didn't have a bibliography, didn't go into much detail. So I wanted to do a much more thorough book. But it just shows that there's always room for scholarship in this. You're, you're never done. There's always stuff to do. Many, many, many posters were done in Cuba that nobody even knows about. So if anybody wants to know, I'd be happy to give you ideas. Karen Wald, a journalist who lived in Cuba many years, did an article in, in Ramparts magazine, which was a major important sort of movement publication at the time. And she showcased Rene Medeiros' posters that were done based on art he did in, 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 in Vietnam. He went to Vietnam twice. Beautiful stuff and just showing this international solidarity. So again, we're starting to see this back and forth and how, how do people see this stuff before the internet? That same series of posters, the Cuban government felt this was so important, they turned it into postage stamps. Can you imagine the United States turning solidarity posters into postage stamps? I mean, these are beautiful. More Rene Madero stuff, Glad Day Press, New York, um, published. You know, they were the major independent movement press in the 70s. They did a solidarity poster with Ho Chi Minh using a Cuban poster design. Um, uh, there was a show recently done by one of Rene Madero's grandchildren in Vietnam. So Cuban art that was done by a Cuban artist who went to Vietnam during the Vietnam War, did posters in, in, Viet in Cuba. His grandson goes back, does an exhibition, and there's reinterpretations of the Cuban posters about Vietnam in Vietnam. It begins to be wild and crazy and beautiful. I've got a website about this, by the way, and there's a really wonderful, it was a wonderful exhibition. Here's some of the, somebody did some typography based on this mishmash of these, these two genres. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, you know, Cuban poster, again, you start to see, you know, Malachias Montoya brought in sort of the Vietnam Chicano connection. You know, Ospal did a poster, Glad Day Press again out of New York did a reinterpretation, uh, they added color to it, but they distributed it and they bootstrapped this image around the United States. Here's a great example where Daisy Garcia, where there were women graphic artists, she did this poster, Solidarity with the Afro-American People. Then it was picked up within the United States with, um, so about with, by uh, the Vencedemos Brigade. So they made it Solidarity with the African People, same image, and then a third version of it was done by a black uh, power group within the United States that lasted for a couple of years. They reinterpreted that image, changed it, and made it their own as well. So it's, it's had multiple lives. Great image. Um, 
And so I, I've done some exhibitions about this, sort of showing this interplay between these two, because this is a very dynamic art form. And posters, you know, everybody loves to see posters and everybody is, reinterprets posters in their head. So, you know, how do people see them? I mean, exhibitions like the one you're about to see at your own institution gives you inspiration. And to see the actual poster on the wall is different than seeing it on a screen as we're doing now. This is the first real exhibition of, of Cuban posters, certainly in the United States. And this was organized by a couple of Cuban artists. And to not scare people off, even though the title is Posters of Revolutionary Cuba, it's a pretty benign image. You don't want to freak people out so you get them to come to the show. This is really, really important to, to have people come. And this was a relatively straight institution to have do a, an exhibition on this stuff. Here's an Ospal poster, again, picked up by, you know, locally to, to high, showcase doing benefit for Cuban solidarity. Um, La Rosa Silkscreen, which was a major movement Chicano print shop in San Francisco, they did posters about Cuba using poster art and their own interpretations as well. Posters su supporting Cuban solidarity. Uh, here's a key American poster that you can see was clearly derived from an Ospal poster, a solid Ospal. So it's just, you just keep seeing these examples. Jane Norling was an American artist in Cuba. She did a poster and she said, I did the poster and I didn't put my name on it. And the Cuban artist, well, put your name on it. She said, well, I thought that was bourgeois to put your name on a poster because that was, that was the, you know, sense within the United States of movement art. They said, oh no, it's okay. So she put her name on the poster. So here's, her, here's another version of it done within the United States using her poster from Cuba. Um, here's a great example of, you know, this, this art, you know, this is Richard Nixon with the Vietnam dead. This is being picked up later on by a, a, a Chicano publication out of the central Southwest American United States. And then even in Ireland, they picked up and reinterpreted that same graphic showing, again, you've got a political leader with what's really going on in his head. It was a wonderful visual interpretation. This happens now. This is, you know, in 69, Emory Douglas did a graphic treatment. Well, then he, he did this for The Five Bloods, which was, was redrawn for this new film that came out last year. And so again, you start to see this concept of how images get reinterpreted as well. Um, artists get inspired by this art. Here's a poster from 71, um, Barbie Joins the Revolution. Well, here, Here's a woman who's so inspired by that treatment that she did her own version of it as an art piece. I encourage people when you do that to give the credit. It's nice to say this is from a Cuban poster from this date. And you know, part of what I'm trying to do is, is lock in who did it, when it was done. This not, should not be anonymous art anymore. We don't have that excuse. I saw this t-shirt down on the street one day and I said, do you know where that's from? And do you know why there's this weird little triangle above this person's head? No, I don't. So I said, here's what the original poster was like. So it's like when people rip off art, they often lose the history and the translation. So I encourage people to try to be history cops. I encourage people, encourage people to reinterpret stuff, but encourage them to honor the credits as well. Here's an Editorial Politica poster that got picked up by the RCP in 2003. Again, it's just wonderful to see the fact that this stuff is so powerful. Um, you know, here's Shepard Ferry did these three posters. I said, no, 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 these are all Cuban posters. So I busted him, got him to pay royalties to the family. Um, he is a, he was sorry, but it was like, you know, if you're making money on this, like I said, within the movement, it's fine. If it's commercial, no, you've got to like treat it with respect and pay royalties. <laughs> um, Rupert Garcia, great, you know, North American Chicago artist, did stuff really in the style of the Cuban posters. You know, Juan Fuentes, who's still doing stuff now, similar style, they, they all credit Cuban posters as being one of their main artistic inspirations. Malakias Montoya, who you saw per earlier poster of his, again, the themes of solidarity, how do you show two countries coming together? 
um, Jane Norling, whose work you saw earlier. She does political campaigns now. And a lot of this stuff, if it were in fits or were in Spanish, I could say, oh, it's a Cuban poster. The style is really similar. Um, more of this stuff, these are contemporary Bay Area graphic artists who, who respect and, and honor the Cuban style and are making it go into the future. Emery Douglas, he's still doing stuff. You know, contemporary stuff about showing these, you know, how this stuff works. I was in Argentina a few years ago and they were thrilled and they're making posters now. These go up on the street. You know, here's, these are posters about defending public education. Well, we all need that. We could do that now in English on the streets of, you know, your city. So, you know, we all deal with, you know, cutbacks, shutdowns, um, you know, and then dealing with new subjects, you know, the, the gender binary. This is a beautiful poster by this women's, you know, lino cut group in Argentina. So people are still making posters now. It's not a lost art. Um, here's a graphic I did showing how we're still struggling with the dialogue with Cuba. This is 1998. Um, here's me uh, and on my brother's shoulders. Um, so I, I've got roots in Cuba, but I am not Cuban, but I, but Cuba is in my blood. And the Cuban revolutionary artwork to me is one of the most inspiring bodies of work imaginable. So this is where I am, I'm reachable. I answer my email and I will clock out now so that um, we can answer questions. I will stop sharing and I'm back. Thank you so much. Um, I, that that was that was mind blowing to see also these images on screen rather than uh, on, on print uh, papers of the uh, uh, printed matters and, and publications. So now I want to invite Eric. <laughs> Th thanks so much, Lincoln. This is uh, what a pleasure, um, and and it's such a pleasure to have a conversation with you about this too, because as you know, I've myself have been deeply involved in um, protest graphics for, for many years, um, including the more recent project happening uh, in Chile. So one paradox that really strikes me about the Cuban poster art is the fact that Cuba really had no previous graphic tradition, political graphic tradition. Certainly when we compare it to say neighboring Mexico, which not only had a very strong muralist tradition, which whose influence went everywhere, uh, not just in Latin America, but even in the United States uh, during the 1930s and 40s, um, and also had a very strong graphic arts tradition from the Taller Grafico Popular, et cetera. Um, and yet it was Cuba that is going to have the largest graphic imp uh, impact across Latin America. Um, and as you're showing, even into the United States in the 19. Uh, late 60s into the 70s and the 80s. So how do you account for that? How do you explain this kind of upstart quality of the Cuban political graphics uh, movement? Well, it, it didn't start off great. You know, after the revolution, a lot of the early posters are pretty boring. You know, they're photographs of Fidel leading the revolution. And, you know, it's, um, they were not artistically inspired. And what broke the ice was the posters that the Cuban Film Institute started to do, where they realized that if we're gonna promote films, we need to have good art. Mm -hmm. And so they brought in a crop of both, you know, senior and young visual artists and gave them pretty free reign in making powerful posters. And the, the political people started to realize, hey, look, these are really hot. People wanna put these on their walls. And so it was the, it was, the cultural people that led the way for the political people, which I have to say was mimicked in the United States because you know, in our country, we had a long dry period of posters between 1945 and 1965 because of the Cold War. We had our own reasons for not making a lot of political posters, but it was the rock posters that broke that open. And, and people said, well, look, they're putting those rock posters on the wall. Let's make political posters that look cool too. So. Os Paul started to hire, you know, graphic artists that were doing really cool posters as well. So the, the neat thing was there's a there's this you know walking on two legs, as, as the Chinese say, that it was the it was the cultural stuff that inspired the better art. And it just took off. And 
for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, the artists had pretty free reign about doing really good artwork. They weren't restricted in their style. They, you know, their, their supervisors realized that if it's really good looking, it's gonna work. So there was a, a remarkable amount of latitude you consider for a country that's, you know, publications by the Cuban Communist Party. Yeah, I want to maybe follow up on that because, you know, the, the famous uh, speech by, by Castro in 61, his message to the, uh, to the intellectuals, and he says famously, you know, within the revolution, anything goes, outside the revolution, nothing goes. And he also says, you know, freedom of form, right? There's not gonna be any discussion about form, but it's about, you know, content, ideological content. So, you know, th uh, this this moment when, when the, 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 this political use of graph, a graphic sensibility and 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 techniques and styles, you know, thinking about the appropriation, whether of the pop art aesthetic that's coming from people like Rauschenberg and and uh, Andy Warhol, or the kind of you know rock countercultural aesthetic. I mean, these were clearly foreign graphic sensibilities. What was that conversation? What were that? What what was happening inside these institutes to uh, around that? I don't know if you if you know necessarily, but it's pretty striking. I, I sort of do. I mean, let's put it this way: I mean, artists are artists, you know, and the artists, the graphic artists that were doing this stuff, were really excited about all this. I mean, there was a lot of great graphic artwork coming out in the '60s. You know, you've got the, you know. I mean, all sorts of really cool stuff was going on and they were inspired by all this stuff and they saw all this stuff and they had the opportunity to come up with some pretty wild and crazy posters, you know, stuff that you would never think of as being political poster art, but within the, the various genres available to them, they were given the pretty much free reign to do stuff about, you know, using goofy colors and crazy combinations of things. And so um, unlike other countries where I think that the artists were had a tighter leash, within Cuba, they were they were given pretty pretty free reign to do stuff. And it wasn't entirely perfect, but all of us have trouble working with clients. But in this case, you can just see the fruit you know, is available. You can the, the stuff that they did was remarkably vibrant and powerful. And they had they had a lot of support within the, within their own agencies. I mean, the, the closest example I have in the United States was during the 30s, where artists were employed, you know, by the Federal Arts Project to go off and make murals and to make to teach poster art. And it's like for the first time, they were getting paid to do art for the public. And this was mind blowing for a lot of these people. Similarly, in Cuba, they were actually they show up at their job and they get paid to do a poster about solidarity with South Africa. For them, this is a peak moment in their artistic lives. You know, what, uh, something else that's striking is that on the one hand, there are clearly, there's, there, there are many, many artists involved, right? But it seems to me that in many cases, and, and I may be mistaken, but in many cases, um, me, these artists do a kind of a, a one-off, you know, and I'm thinking of that phenomenal poster by um, Acela Perez of the, you know, armed Latin America. There, you didn't show up at the real vibrant one where Latin America, South America is, is a god of fist, but you don't really see her showing up again. Maybe she does, but not in the same way that you've got the kind of like the equivalent of Los Tres Grandes, you know, for Mexican muralism. You know, you've got Maderos, you've got Roscard, and you've got Box. So how did those three become sort of in a, in a class of, of their own and how does, what, what can you say about this larger kind of community of graphic artists? Based on my own experience of talking to people and being there, for one thing, it was a pretty collegial bunch of people. They all, it's a small, you know, you're talking a city of a million people. Um, it's, and they know each other. You know, these people doing this kind of work, they all knew each other. And, and very often you'd get people who'd sort of blend from one agency to another. It's not like you only work for us, Paul. You, you could sort of work, you could do artwork for all sorts of people. And so they would often cross over and, and work, do a poster for somebody else. And again, sometimes people would make one poster that was a great poster and then move on to doing something else. That happens here. You, know, you get people who, you know, 
there's there are iconic posters that we have in our within our vernacular that somebody did one or two posters and you know for a variety of reasons that's all they did yeah. um so it's there's a variety of reasons but and some of these people were just incredibly prolific i mean box you know did like a, you know four posters a day almost i mean he was just cranking stuff out so some of these people were just incredibly prolific um you know, it's it's a there's a variety of reasons why some people sort of got more. But again, you know, how come almost all the black solidarity black posters you see are Emory Douglases? It's not like he tried to be the dominant black artist, but nine times out of ten, if you see a poster illustrating, you know, black visual art, it's Emory Douglas. But there were many other people who did one or two posters. So part of our job as historians is to bring those people up and elevate the people who got the get the less exposure. Yeah. You know, so in, in that classic 1970 essay that Susan Sontag wrote in The Art of, of Revolution from the, the book that you showed, she has this line, she says that, you know, the Cuban political posters, they flatter the senses. And and it, to me, it's a really resonant phrasing. And, and I, you know, it, it strikes me that that quality still holds true more than 50 years later. You know, we're still these posters still flatter our senses. Um, what accounts for this captivating aesthetic quality of these posters? Well, I, 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 part of it is I think that Cuba is a really, I, mean, I love Cuba. It's a special country. People there have a particular style. And, you know, you can't generalize about everybody in a whole country, but it's a country where people do appreciate life and enjoy and enjoy themselves and enjoy family and you know it's you see that again in you know in countries like france or argentina where you go and you, and you see countries where that, that really value family value community yeah, and so aesthetics is important aesthetics is not something that you sort of put on the side aesthetics is front and center in your life and if you're going to do a poster if it's not visually attractive why bother doing it so the Cubans really get it, and they brought in their own sort of, you know, Caribbean tropical style to this stuff in a way that isn't, you don't see that in the Mexican posters or even the Chilean posters. It's, there's a particular aesthetic of, of Cuban stuff that I think you really, is just permeates this entire body of work. So you would agree then that posters can be kind of identified in a sense by uh, a certain national characteristics. I would I would certainly say that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's interesting. Sometimes you're wrong, but but yeah. there are certain the qualities. You go, yeah, I bet that's a Cuban poster. Yeah, I mean, but it's interesting because you know, while to some degree we could say that, say maybe painting or other kinds of artistic forms also can be identified as you know with national characteristics. Generally speaking, we see an artist as being an artist on their own terms. But what aspects do you find in a kind of maybe it's a deeper political or cultural sense uh, qualify or define posters as as national in that sense? Well, I mean, for one thing, the, the Cuban government, as you saw from the examples, took posters themselves as a medium seriously. And so if you were, you know, living in Havana and even living in the countryside. You know, you walk into any, you know, union hall or school or whatever, and there are posters on the walls. And many of these posters, people would take home and put on their walls. So posters, just like in the United States in the 60s, were a very popular form. And so it was just, it rose to the top. And posters, you know, have their, have their ebbs and flows within the world. And, you know, so I, you know, in Cuba in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, posters were really popular. People like them and they were cheap and available. So they were all over the place. There's some really good questions popping up here, by the way. Let me ask one last question and then segue into that. And this is a, it, maybe it's a little bit more difficult question to answer, but I'll throw it out there. You know, aesthetics aside, thinking here of the Oshball posters in particular, um, do you see those those Oshball posters as contributing to, to, to violence in the 1960s through the 1980s? Um, or do you think the posters mostly appealed to kind of middle-class youth and others who, you know, identified with the moral, the moral imperative of these revolutionary movements, but didn't necessarily 
join these movements themselves. The posters went up on the walls. I mean, because we're starting with the premise that the posters actually do have agency, that they do motivate, they are propaganda. Um, but I, I, I wonder how you feel about that. Okay. When you say the word violence, yeah. this, is where I, this is where I bring in something that I think is really important to understand about all of this stuff, is that when you see a weapon in any of these posters, it has a very specific purpose. And when you see a, an aircraft carrier or a bomber or something like that, that, that is a, a, a violent tool of imperialism. When you see an AK-47 or a spear or a bow and arrow, these are weapons of resistance. And so there's a really huge ideological distinction made in all of these posters about what, what weapons mean and what self-defense means. And so, and this is a country that had you know, recently come out of its revolution. I mean, imagine if we were making posters in America, you know, 20 years after our revolution. I mean, it's, this is, you know, the, the idea of armed resistance to bad stuff is, is part of the visual ver vocabulary here. So when you see, you know, Emery Douglas has an image of a, of a woman and a child with a pistol, it's like, oh my God, this isn't like gangs. It's not about gangs. It's about community self-defense. And so that distinction was really certainly understood at the time. You know, these don't in any way, in my mind, glorify violence. And they, in fact, honor the notion that people have a right to, to armed self-defense and nations have a right to armed self-defense. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good way of answering it. Let's um. Can I just have a follow-up question? Sure. Um, so on the question of, uh, I guess, um, uh, uh, a cult of energy or flattering our senses. It seems like, Eric, you're arguing, and I agree that that aesthetic element still resonates with us to the viewers, contemporary viewers. But maybe some visual shorthands um, might be misinterpreted today or, or may seem outdated to today's audience. So what do you think, Lincoln? Do you think every single poster um, would have a different relationship with contemporary viewer besides the fact of this like energy that it has? Oh, sure. I mean, it's, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, people, you know, we're right now, gun violence is, is a big thing in our country. Well, we got a country where, you know, Americans have like more guns than cars, you know, and it's like, it's really, it's, it's when you think about what that means in a society, it's crazy. And sort of our, our view of what a gun means in a poster is different than what it might mean, certainly seeing that same poster, even in this country in 1968. So a lot of these, as, hit, as time goes by, you know, all art requires some interpretation. You know, there's no such thing as perfect art that is universal and works everywhere. People go, wait a second. I mean, there's actually, there's a great example of a Cuban poster that shows a woman applying lipstick and then a Vietnamese woman, you know, and it's, I, I, it's a complicated image to show, but it's some people have interpreted it an entirely different way. Like, oh, wow, you know, it never even occurred to me that you could even see that same poster that way. So our role as art historians is to sort of look at those examples and go, wow, I can see why you saw it that way. Here's why it wasn't meant to be that way. And so it adds, it adds a whole new depth. But that's one reason I like doing these presentations is to explain what's going on in their heads at the time and, and how it worked at the time and, and how it may or may not work now. But in some ways, these things work now better than ever. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a moving target, as they say. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So do you want to read the questions or do you want me uh, to open or? Uh, yeah, I, I could read. Um, so there are a couple of questions and, and I invite everyone to uh, add more questions in the chat. Um, so Daniel Menzo asks, it's really interesting to see how uh, the minimal use of photography, which is also commonly described as being a democratic medium. 
Do you know how these artists design or start of photography and their creative process? Yeah, there's a couple of things I want to point out. Um, many of these posters are screen prints or silk screens. And the technology to put a photographic image in a silk screen poster, certainly in the 60s and 70s, wasn't as advanced as it is now. I mean, I made posters during this period and many of these are literally hand cut stencils. And so the photographic option in a poster technically was trickier and harder to do, which explains part of the reason why a lot of these use these bold fields of color as opposed to using a photograph. But also um, artists, all artists are inspired by photographs. And very often for any of these images, I can show you a news photo that, that the artist used to translate into making a bold graphic visual image. So photographs, certainly by photojournalists, play an incredibly powerful role in a lot of poster graphic artwork. Um, unless it's something that's just totally out of your head. You know, if it's a picture of a face, well, you rarely just make it up. You find a photograph, you put a sheet of paper over it, you redraw it, you use, artists use photographs all the time. And that's a weak link in crediting because artists rarely credit the photographer that they used as a source, but artists today use photographs all the time. So that happened a lot with the same artwork as well. But, but as, a, as a final poster, very few of these were done as a final piece of artwork that was then photographed and then reproduced. They would design something and the final step at the print shop was that they would cut the stencils and print the thing. And very often the first time that the actual poster was a real object was after it had been printed. Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, something maybe about material and technical um, aspect of the poster production. Could you tell us whether all three publishers would have had access to similar level of advanced technology of printing or did they have access to different levels of technologies at the time? They all, they all had access to, I mean, the, the people that ran the big presses, the ones that would do the, you know, mul the, the multicolor offset printing, you know, that was the Cuban Communist Party and I've been to their print shop. Um, but again, if you do, for example, if you're only doing a hundred copies of a poster, which is like very often with 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 um, a kayak, if you're just putting up posters to show for a film in these kiosks, you don't need very many posters. And so a short run screen print is actually a more efficient way to do it than to do it as an offset poster. So you save the offset tools for the longer runs, for the ones that have to be really much bigger. There's a, you, you pick the tools that are necessary for your goal. And so some of these were deliberately short run screen prints. Some of these were long run offsets. Sometimes they'd start off as a screen print. And if it was popular, then they'd do an offset version and do 3000 instead of 200. So again, the different media reflected a variety of, of design and ultimate distribution needs. Just to follow uh, even, the, even the offset stuff, their equipment was pretty basic. You know, they were, you know, I saw equipment that I thought, wow, they still do that, but they did the best they could with the, under the circumstances. And so it's an example where you don't need the best, fanciest equipment to make incredibly powerful posters. I mean, for the visual artists, I saw stuff that was done. That I saw, oh, did you use... Um, airbrush. Oh no, I got a toothbrush, put some ink on it and spritzed it. I mean, you use really simple tools to make this stuff. You don't rely on expensive modern technology. You, you, do, what, you do with what you have and it's extremely powerful um, work with, you know, with a few resources. Do you know, Lincoln, do you know where they were getting the ink supplies from? Yeah, I mean, they'd get ink. I saw ink from Cuba, ink from other countries. Um, I mean, you use ink that wasn't really even printing ink. You use you know, house painting stuff. I mean, it's like, you, just like here, if you're broke, you use whatever you've got. Were they so, manufacturing ink or were they getting it from Mexico or Europe? Or they, were getting, you know, they were getting screen print ink from Mexico. I mean, it's like, there's, you know, again, we think of the embargo as totally cramping their style, but, you know, you'd get ink and paper from other countries. Mm -hmm. So 
it's um, they weren't cut off, but it was harder. It would have been a lot easier if they could get their ink and paper from Florida, but they couldn't. Mm -hmm. But they made yeah. do. Thank you. So um, we have another question by by Elise Armani. So on the subject of family, I would like to ask you if you could speak to your understanding of the representation of children in those ball posters. My hypothesis is that they stand in often for what is at stake uh, in a given uh, imperial environment or environmental crisis. Um, have you learned anything from the artists you've spoken with about why they may have chosen to center children in so many of the posters? Now, Ospal didn't use children that much. They sometimes did when they would show children. They would show children as resistance fighters, which is important to show that this is a people's resistance. It wasn't just, you know, some sort of military branch that was fighting colonialism or imperialism. It was, it, it was a people's war. And that was part of the purpose of showing women and children was that everybody was engaged in this resistance process. There were, all, there were a lot of children in posters by the Torre Politica. You know, you'd see posters that would have children in them, which was, again, honoring the fact that children were part of Cuban society. And I mean, there's, you know, May Day posters that have children in them. And you think, you think of May Day as being this militant. No, it was, it was about our version of May Day is an event to celebrate the revolutionary tradition that includes the elevation of children's in society. And so the idea of children in a May Day poster is something you don't usually think of from the United States point of view. From the Cuban point of view, the Cuban Communist Party felt it was totally appropriate to have children in this. They really felt that family was, was part of what you want to show as being the, the revolutionary goal. Um, and, and, you, and you see these posters in people's homes. Like I said, it's um, you know, people want, it's, these were, this is affordable art. And so you'd see this stuff on the wall and you think, oh, it's, the, the government says you've got to have posters of Fidel Castro. Well, actually that's not true. You know, that, that kind of myth about Cuban propaganda, you'd see a lot of posters about Che Guevara. Che's image was extremely popular. You know, he was really seen as, you know, even though he wasn't Cuban, he was essential to the Cuban revolution. And so his image was really popular in all sorts of places. You, you could hardly walk into any sort of a public space without seeing a poster about Che Guevara. Whereas Fidel was not, there was not a cult of personality about Che Guevara, I mean, about Fidel Castro. So you see, you know, Jose Marti and, 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 and Che, but, but not, not Fidel. There was not a cult of personality about that. Yeah. I think we have a couple of questions about distribution and circulation. Okay. So um, Adrian says, uh, thank you. I particularly enjoy the kind of archaeology of the circulation, some of these images. Um, so you give us a sense of the international circulation of these posters. Uh, could you give us a sense of how they were received domestically among Cubans? Uh, where they place on the walls of people's homes, of institutions and collected. And, and I guess um, as a related question uh, also, I mean, did the Cuban citizens have to pay for the posters? Were they given away? That would be also my question. Um, and um, Elise's uh, question, um, have you done any data visualizing um, the re reach um, and distribution of the poster? Does OSPAL have historical mailing lists? Uh, how can we today understand the scope of OSPAL uh, poster um, and magazine distribution? That's all you want to ask? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me break out some of these questions. For one thing, um, I, don't, I don't have Tricontinental's mailing list I'm sure that the CIA does, but um, it's it's an area of research that's really a legitimate one. I know that they were you could you could ask to be on their mailing list, and so almost every movement and left organization in the United States was getting copies of Tricontinental in the mail. Um, there may be somebody who's who's researched exactly sort of in more detail who is getting it. It's a great question. I don't have the answer to that, but I do know that very often, you know, I, people who give me copies of posters say, oh yeah, 
I received this in my copy of Tricontinental. It was mailed to my office or it was mailed to me at Ramparts Magazine or you know, I personally subscribed. Um, so people did, I know people received it that way. Um, the question of internal distribution, um, very often these were distributed for free. And, you know, you, you know Tricontinental would have, a f they'd, they'd have a booth at a fair and they'd make sure that people, there's copies of the posters. And they had a whole warehouse for distribution. And if somebody said, oh, we're doing something about solidarity with Angola, can we get some posters to give out? It would give them out. These were intended to be available. But here's a really fascinating thing that I learned was sometimes when something is free, it's devalued. So I had a fascinating conversation with the head of Editora Politica one day about, well, so how do you distribute these? And they say, usually we give them out, but we've been experimenting. We did this experiment. We had a big May Day event, Plaza de Mayo, thousands and thousands of people. And at one corner, they had a table of, of Editora Politica posters they were giving away for free. At the other corner, they were charging a, mo a modest amount. And at the free table, people would sort of walk by. If they pick it up, they sort of fold it up and shove it in their pocket. At the pay table, people go, oh, that's really nice. Give them the peso, carefully roll it up, walk away with it. It's, it's a fascinating thing to understand that people often devalue things that are free. And this challenges a lot of elements of socialism is how do you do this in a way that people don't take it for granted? So uh, this was a fascinating conversation I had with this fellow, but it, it really raised the idea of, huh, sometimes when you give it away for free, it does get devalued. But in Cuba, a lot of these posters were free and available. Can I just find a quick follow-up? I, I was going to say, Che Guevara would be sorely disappointed in the failure of the moral economy there. But, you know, what's interesting, there is a kind of paradox, because on the one hand, we think of, you know, and we know, like, as a, as a tangible fact that uh, the magazine Tricontinental went everywhere. But as a researcher, like, I've never come across it in, like, used book stands in Latin America. The only time I've read the Tricontinental at the New York Public Library. You know, I mean, it's archived, yeah. but it's not widely available. Unlike other kinds of magazines, you know, that, that one can find in, you know, used book stands in different places in Latin America. So how do we account for that paradox? Like where do these original magazines disappear to? I mean, maybe they're destroyed by military governments, you know, who knows, I guess, but. There's probably a million answers to that. I mean, part of it depends on the library's collection policy. Um, I mean, I know that we have, a, I think we have a pretty much full run of Tricontinentals at UC Berkeley's library. But, um, you know, it's, as with all political stuff, it has a much more ephemeral life than conventional publications. And so, you know, it would be interesting to see, you know, which library in Chile might have a secret stash of these. Um, and sometimes people do have secret stashes. Um, but part of, you know, it's really important to, to draw out where people can go to do the research on this stuff. It'd be great to have an entire run of Tricontinental digitized online. Um, and I think that there's no reason that shouldn't happen. It hasn't happened yet. But that's, that, that's the next step. That's the kind of stuff that I'm working on. That's a lot of what I do is turning analog material that's sitting in drawers or shelves into digital stuff that's accessible online and making it as available as possible. So um, Elise actually asked a follow-up question that also uh, touches upon what Eric was saying. Are there um, any particular regions of the world uh, where um, tricontinental uh, magazines and OSPA posters were more heavily distributed? Um, or I where? Don't know, I, I, I don't know the details of where they went. Um, and, you know, there, it'd, be, it'd be a great research subject is, that, is getting into the weeds about the distribution. Because like I said, this was an incredibly powerful distribution tool. And, you know, I mean, Playboy magazine realized you could put a fold out in something and they're like, wow, it helps to sell the magazine. I mean, I know people who probably got Tricontinental for the posters. I mean, these were 
part of the subscription to the magazine was getting a great poster with it. I mean, what a deal. So that's a whole area of research that I have not done. I'm probably not going to do. Somebody should do. And I'd be happy to help whoever wants to do that. Give them some leads. I, I, just, I was going to just add to that. I mean, the magazine itself was kind of stayed and, and politically just uh, predictable, you know, whereas the posters were exciting, you know, um, and the graphic sensibility in general, there was a lot of humor in the graphics. There were a lot of comics, you know, as you know, sort of political comic elements to, to the magazine. But the articles were, you know, celebrating North Korea, you know, they're just, you know, it was kind of boring. Um, so, but again, like I've done a lot of, you know, you know, perusing of used book stands throughout Latin America, looking for, you know, other kinds of political magazines and countercultural magazines from the 60s and 70s. And I've never come across the Tricontinental. So it is kind of odd to me that on the one hand, we sort of know or are told that it went everywhere, but it's kind of nowhere to be found either, except for, you know, in certain libraries. And my guess is that once the posters were stripped out, people said, eh, you know, there must be a bunch of these somewhere else. We'll dump them. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I sorry to Lincoln uh, bombard you with distribution question that you already de designated the status of further research. Um, but um, just the, your, your point about the U.S.-Cuban relations and how it wasn't actually Cubans who didn't want to send things to the U.S. It was the U.S. Treasury Department that banned spending money in Cuba. Yes. Um, but I also know, for example, in the 80s, um, uh, um, uh, the, the Havana Biennale couldn't actually invite works from China because of the state policy of not really working closely with the Chinese state. Right. So, so were there tri-continentals, best of your guess and speculation and knowledge, um, definitely didn't reach? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, my guess is that, um, I mean, things were, you know, during this period, things were great with the Soviet Union and with Vietnam, but not so great with China, you know. And so I'm sure that there are places where one would not easily be able to get the magazine. Um, and, but there were, you know, there were probably people that would smuggle them in one way or another. Um, but the, you know, I mean, China during this period was going through a whole other bunch of stuff and their own style of posters were totally different. Um, you can, you know, it's like night and day, the Chinese posters and the Cuban posters. Um, but, and I don't even know, you know, who in China was able to even see what the Cuban posters were. Whereas in many other countries, they were at least exposed to them. So um, th this whole, this whole thing of how art, travels from one country to another and how it's inspiring and gets recycled is is a really important subject i think that art history doesn't doesn't pay much attention to and there's a whole fantasy about art making that it oh, just springs from your head well i think that all art is derivative and it's something that you saw maybe you saw it a week ago maybe you saw it 10 years ago but few purely original designs happen they're all derived from something and so exploring and honoring the fact that that's, that's the way it is, and here's examples, and saying, how, here's how you do it in a way that's good, is a really important thing to promote. Because it, it, for one thing, it disabuses the people of being worried about, oh, gee, I like this, but you know, should I use this image? Well, use it, but transform it, make it your own, and give credit to it. That's perfectly cool and part of the revolutionary vernacular. Yes, I love how um, the emphasis on um, uh, tracing the history of each image's inspiration um, is not really to um, uh, put the original work on the pedestal, but it's really to emphasize the intercultural, intergenerational dialogue. So I really appreciate your point. And, and, and I just wanted to also have a plug in. Um, we have on December 1st, the opening of the exhibition, uh, Printing Solidarity, uh, graphic designer Scott Starrett, who actually designed um, 
uh, Alexia Ocasio-Cortez's uh, political campaign um, and how he was also inspired by this um, startling um, uh, graphics uh, of, of uh, Cuban posters. Um, so that's uh, exciting uh, contemporary uh, resonance. But maybe the last question um, about women artists in um, uh, the Cuban graphic uh, uh, production culture. You showed uh, multiple women artists actually in your slides, uh, including uh, Daisy Garcia. And I loved how one of the case study of uh, visual translation was her um, head and uh, family embedded it in the head. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so could you tell us more about um, uh, the status of women artists um, within um, USPAL and other, other organizations? Yeah, yes. Within the, 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 the agency that I know the most about is OSPAL because it's a fairly defined body of work. Um, and I sort of looked at the proportion of women, or identifiable women there. Um, but you know, the, the largest body of work is the production of Editora Politica. And I've sort of, you know, I see it mirrored in their output, similar to what happened in OSPAL, which is that. There were posters by women. I don't see any evidence that women were discriminated against in terms of doing the artwork, but there just were fewer women graphic artists contributing to this body of work. Um, but some of the most notable and, and powerful ones were by women. And so it's, I, I have really tried to make an effort at pointing those ones out and, and trying to track down more about them there's less known about them in their biographies. And so that's a really important area of work of making sure that it's not just seen as, as male, but certainly talking to the other artists, they felt a very collegial relationship with the women artists. Um, there just weren't as many in, in part of this production. Thank you so much. Um, so we might have only a couple of minutes uh, until we close this uh, Q&A session. Eric, Come do you on, have any more questions? Or may I ask you, Lincoln, then? Um, so you talked about distribution being a possible dissertation topic <laughs> or research topic for young scholars. Are there other areas you really believe there's so much to dig into? Well, one is sort of the artist client relationship. You know, I have anecdotal information, I've talked to some people about it, but um, to really drill into, I mean, for example, some Cuban artists felt so stifled by how they had to work that they, and for you know, other personal reasons, decided to leave Cuba. That doesn't mean that they hated the Cuban Revolution. It just meant that, you know, I'm, I don't, I want to leave, live in another country. And like, there's an artist that I've established a relationship with who lives in Mexico who moved there, you know, 30 years ago. He, you know, he's still being supported and honored by the by Cuba, but. He's living in Cuba, I mean, in Mexico. So looking at the details during this period of how it actually worked, you know, how assignments were made, how editing went, um, how many people said, I had a great design, I got it turned down because it was too, too homo homosexual or to women, or what is it that get, got designs rejected? Getting into the details of, how artistic productivity meshed with acceptance within the design agencies and you know that back and forth, which happens in every country, but really that's a fascinating element of how art not only gets made, but gets accepted and published. And that's a rocky road. And getting into the details about that would be really good to do. Yeah, can I just ask one thing? You know, so um, Oshpal, right, just recently closed its offices um, what, a year and a half, two year years ago. ago. And so what becomes of those archives? Well, they've got physical archives there that they've got a warehouse. You know, some of them they don't have any copies of. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't exactly know. My guess is that a lot of that's been turned over. I, I just don't know what's happened to it. I haven't, I haven't found out. Um, but I mean, some of these posters certainly Let's put it this way. Some of the posters were uglier and less attractive and they've got a bigger stack of them. The more attractive and, and powerful posters are all gone. So I don't know what's left. 
Um, but what about documents? I mean, aside from well, the that's a good question. My guess is that this stuff probably went to the National Library, you know, the mm -hmm. Biblioteca Nacional Jose Marti, which mm -hmm. serves as the archives for the Republic of Cuba, probably received their working documents. Is my guess, but I don't know. That would have, that would be the common thing. We don't have a national library. We have a Library of Congress, mm -hmm. which is its job is to serve the research needs of Congress. But most other countries have a national library to accept all of the nation's output. We don't have that. It's sort of an example of how we are quite on the same page, so to speak, as other countries about our cultural patrimony. Thank you, Lincoln. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. It's always fun to talk about this stuff. And like I said, I answer emails and, you know, there's, I'm sure that there's, there's things that are going to come up. So I have, I have a Ross Guard knockoff that I want to share. I'm going to send you an email from that I found in Chile. To me, really just totally caught my eye as, as right. Ross Guard, but it, in the Chilean context. So I, I'm going to share that with you. <laughs> Okay, and I only showed you the tip of the iceberg. Talk. I've got a lot of other stuff as well, but this was, I think this gives a good overview of why this stuff is so powerful and important. Okay, well, I guess it's time to say goodbye. Enjoy your afternoon. But I started this in New York and um, we're enjoying <laughs> the fact that we've got rain for the first time in months. Yeah.